So I have 45 minutes to, to, to present, not to present uh, the, the two papers, but to, to, um, to rest on these two papers in order to uh, discuss with you just after about uh, one topic, of course, uh, I like and I, and I work a lot since 15 years, the, the, the concept of clusters. And because this is a master of economic policy, I think, about the, 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 the cluster policy. Okay? Uh, so the two papers uh, you have probably read uh, yet uh, are related. Are re the first one is more focused on theories and the second one is more, more focused on uh, empirics. Uh, so the, the first paper is lock-in, lock-out how structural properties of knowledge networks affect regional resilience. Uh, and this is mainly a theoretical uh, paper that try to focus on one point, uh, one very simple point, uh, what kind of structural properties of knowledge networks uh, allow clusters succeed in overlapping uh, technological domain and markets. Okay? And the second one is a pure empirical paper uh, in, in which with my colleagues, uh, with my PhD student Delio, we try to, not to assess, but to, uh, to go into the, the, the cluster policy, the French cluster policy, in a particular case, the, the, the famous aerospace valley uh, in, uh, in Toulouse, that's my place, uh, in, in Toulouse uh, during, during 10 years. Okay, and as Tristan just said, uh, my presentation is also uh, based on the, this uh, book, I published uh, two years ago, I think, the, eco the economics of uh, clusters uh, that will be translated very, very, very soon uh, in, in English. So, just a few words on, on the background of these two papers and how we can relate both together. Uh, I don't know if you are very familiar with clusters. Uh, if you are not familiar with clusters, I, I just have to speak about the Silicon Valley and you know what is a cluster because Silicon Valley is a cluster, is the most famous cluster uh, in the world. Uh, and this is not only an agglomeration of innovative activities, it's more than an agglomeration. It's a kind of network organization that allow organization and people combining knowledge in particular ways and innovate more than organization in other places. Okay? Uh, so clusters are leading places of knowledge-based economies today. And these clusters are at the intersection, in terms of thinking, uh, uh, at the intersection of geography uh, on one side and uh, networks, uh, knowledge networks on the other side. And uh, in my research, uh, since 15 years, uh, I, I try to show that one of the most important uh, entry to, 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 uh, to understand cluster dynamics uh, is to focus on the structural properties of these uh, networks. Uh, uh, your Facebook network has particular structural properties and you have particular place, position uh, in, the, in this network. So there are a wide range of research about networks and I will give you some uh, basics uh, uh, on that. Um, that's the first background, maybe the, the theoretical background. Uh, the second background is in Europe, mainly in Europe, uh, the rise of cluster policies. Since the end of the uh, 90s, uh, every European country has built its own cluster policy. In France, in Italy, in Spain, in Germany, uh, in Netherlands. Uh, so what are the rationales of, of these cluster policies? Uh, if you are economist, you know that in innovation policy, the main argument defended by economists is the, the concept of market failure. Okay? Since Arrow, for instance, we speak about market failure in order to show that uh, the market uh, system do, does not provide enough incentives for firms to innovate. And if we, if we want to analyze cluster, we have to focus on a, an additional type of failure, the network failure, meaning that uh, uh, the, it's a kind of systemic failure, you know, it's, it's not a pure market failure, but a systemic failure. Uh, firms do not, uh, the, the system do not provide enough incentive to innovate uh, because of a lack of interaction between innovative organizations. Okay? 
and what, what is the target of this of the policy makers implementing uh, cluster policy uh, it's it, the, 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 the target is to try to reproduce Silicon Valley uh, uh, elsewhere so the first paper uh, is about cluster resilience uh, I can try to start uh, no I have two slides on a, on a, some stylized facts uh, the idea is to understand the evolutionary process through which a cluster succeeds in maintaining its growth path uh, by disconnecting its growth cycle to the cycle of market and technologies. Because when a technology declines, the cluster in which this technology uh, is produced can also decline. And the idea is to understand why some regions succeed in uh, uh, reproducing another cycles when the previous technology decline okay for instance in my city Toulouse if I don't know at random uh, the aircraft industry decline Toulouse will disappear or Toulouse will be uh, renew itself on another market okay that's the main idea of this paper so some regions can have difficulties to cope with this market decline even if they were performing during the maturity stage of the technology or the, the market, and some others reorganize networks in order to uh, leave a path for entering into a new related one. And the notion of relatedness will be very important uh, in the following uh, presentation. So the aim is to understand the resilient properties of regional cluster uh, with the help of two simple structural uh, signatures or property of local knowledge network and to discuss these structural properties around two simple signatures that can help policymakers, for instance, to uh, implement new uh, clusters policy. Just to give you an illustration, uh, here you have the employment growth in the Silicon Valley from uh, 79 to 89, so 10 years, a very short period, 10 years period. But the Silicon Valley go through a decline phase in 85. OK? Uh, and Annalise Aksenian, who is a famous scholar uh, working on the, on the Silicon Valley, show us that this is not, Silicon Valley is not the, the result of a national policy, not the result of a market dynamics, but uh, the result of a particular network dynamics. And she show us that uh, when the semiconductor industry entered a mature uh, phase, in the Silicon Valley, and the semiconductor industry uh, um, was developed also uh, in uh, some ASEAN countries. Uh, the, the employment start uh, to, to decline, and two or three years after, the computer industry was born. Okay, and she show, she show us that the main uh, firms of the semiconductor industry uh, has started to change. Uh, their relationships and stop to work together between the semiconductors companies but try to work with other companies and in particular with young companies like uh, IBM, like uh, uh, Apple and, and others. And then the computer industry was born just after the decline of the semiconductor industry. And I have tried to, uh, for especially for the book, I have tried to uh, generalize this idea in the Silicon Valley on the right, you have the ranking of the main companies uh, of the Silicon Valley in terms of chiffre uh, d'affaires, not value added, uh, in, in terms of sales. Okay, uh, you have between the, the first and the uh, twenty position all the firms of the semiconductor industry and the computer industry, and you can see the wave of the internet in grey and the wave of the green tech, okay? It's, it's nice to see this wave, but one wave do not kill the former because the semiconductor is still on the top of the ranking, the computer industry is still at the top of the ranking, and some new waves appear each 10 years, okay? Yeah? Yes, uh, 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 you have uh, the years and the ranking 
in the, uh, this is a database, the Silicon Valley 100, c'est le classement, uh, the, the ranking. Ah, le, le classement, c'est en chiffre, en sales, en vente. Sales. sales. Uh, this is the ranking in the sales distribution of the firms of the Silicon Valley. Okay. I, for, I forgot to translate the, <laughs> yeah. Okay, so uh, the question is how some regions like Silicon Valley, but also others, uh, succeed in uh, overlapping a mature market with an emerging one. And the idea of Saxonian, and the idea I try to develop uh, in my research is to show that uh, this overlapping process go through um, um, a kind of flexibility in knowledge networks. I, I will show that. So in this paper, um, network theories are numerous uh, in sociology, in physics, also a little bit in economics, uh, and many properties have been developed And we try to show here that only two properties matter to understand uh, this kind of trade-off between uh, performance and resilience. Because a cluster uh, has to be performant, but it has also to be resilient. Okay? And these two statistical signatures are the network hierarchy and the network assertivity. The network hierarchy refers, uh, refers on the degree distribution. For instance, in this room, uh, Tristan has 100 relationships. You have 50 relationships, you have uh, 20 relationships, and so on and so on, and uh, you have only one relationship. So the distribution of degree in this room is very sloped. Okay? There is a strong hierarchy with few people having, having many relationships and a lot of people having uh, uh, few relationships. Okay? At the reverse, we can have a room with every people having only 10 relationships, and then the, the distribution is flat. Okay? It matters. In industrial economics, it matters. Why? Because every industry is a systemic one. For instance, the mobile phone industry is a systemic one. You have knowledge about telecommunication, about software, about uh, design, about many things. Okay? Uh, the automotive industry is also uh, systemic because you have the cars, but also some software, software inside, some security devices inside. So many knowledge coming from different industrial environments. Okay? So uh, this kind of uh, property of hierarchy is important because in order to reach the most market, an industry needs to have some leaders coordinating a lot of knowledge. And some other scholars have previously shown that when an, when an industry emerge, the hierarchy is flat. You have kind of very scattered structure of small firms interacting together, but without leaders able to coordinate the system as a whole. Okay? For instance, in the Silicon Valley, Google, uh, not Google, but uh, Hewlett Packard uh, coordinate many things into the Silicon Valley. Okay? For in my place, Airbus coordinate many activities Uh, in, the, in, in my region. Okay. Um, so this property is very important. The second one, uh, less confidential in the literature, uh, is a property of assortativity. What does it mean? It means that Tristan, who has 100 relationships, congratulations, uh, has relationships with whom? Do he have relationships with people having also many relationships? Or do we have relationships with people having few relationships? This is the meaning of this property. If rich people in terms of relationships have relationships with people having also many relationships, the network is assortative. At the reverse, if I have many relationships, but most of my relationships are with people having few relationships, the network is non-assortative or disassortative. Okay? Just an example, very interesting example. The, the um, network of scholars, of academics. Do you think Jean Tirol write papers with people having few citations? Or at the reverse, do Tirol write papers with people having, uh, I don't know the first, many or... Okay. So, in general, uh, academic networks are very assortative. 
highly seated scholars work with highly seated scholars. Okay? Of course, there are some exceptions. But the exceptions are really important because, in general, novelty comes from these, ex these exceptions. Uh, so the combined dimension of these two properties give different situations for clusters between lock-in and lock-out and between performance and, and resilience. And also we speak about social networks uh, because <coughs> physical networks are, have not the same dynamics than uh, human or social networks. Uh, the tra the trade-off between performance and resilience is not the same, the same because since myopic fluids cross uh, physical networks, and at the reverse, strategic uh, and rational behaviors uh, of knowledge exchange cross uh, the, the, the human and social uh, networks. So degree distribution, I, I, I have just defined, but I, I can uh, uh, restart again. So cluster can display the distribution of degree centralities from a flat to a sloped one. Uh, hierarchy of positions in the web of relationships. Some organizations can have many relations due to a high relational capa capacity or capabilities. Uh, in general linked to the size of the company, the size of the firm, uh, or the openness degree of their model of knowledge valuation. Because I can be a big firm, but with a strong model of knowledge appropriativeness, so with few relations. But in general, uh, big companies have many relations, in particular in very complex and systemic industries. At the opposite, some others remain poorly connected due to their newness, dot com or spin off for young companies uh, their small size or their closed model of knowledge valuation and the degree correlation uh, you, you can translate assortativity by structural homophily uh, it's captured generally by a network index of assortativity the structure of relationships will be assortative when highly connected nodes tend to be connected disproportionately to over highly or high degree nodes. Then the level of network assertivity gives a formal representation of the way by which knowledge flows in a network between the core of highly connected nodes and the periphery of uh, poorly connected nodes. Okay? Um, does performance go against resilience or some particular structural properties? Are they better suited for, for both? The idea is to show in this paper that when your key goes with this assortativity, cluster can be performant and resilient at the same time. Okay? But of course, non-assortative behaviors are not the rule of the social life. In general, people are structurally assortative. I'm rich, I would like to interact with rich people. I'm the highly French-cited uh, uh, scholars, I just want to write with uh, Philippe Aguillon and not with Tristan Ouvray. Oh, <laughs> so it's, it, this is a kind of natural, this kind of natural uh, way of thinking from people. I'm not sure this is really efficient in terms of innovation, but this is a kind of natural trend uh, in, in the society. Okay? So successful and performing clusters are the ones that reach the, to, to set up, to, in, to impose a well-integrated and performing complex technological system on Mars market. And in general, these clusters evolve from an initial scattered structure of burgeoning organizations uh, towards a kind of oligopolistic structure with few and few big organizations uh, when the products reach uh, maturity. And along the life cycle of products, such a network dynamics produce path dependence, technological lock-in, and the more technology generates increasing returns to adoption, I don't know if you know this concept of Brian Arthur, uh, the more markets for this technology become locked in, locked in and resist to other competing technologies. So when a technology reaches the mass market, also the cluster, uh, the cluster um, gain a kind of monopolistic position in the world, okay? And today, the Silicon Valley has a kind of monopolistic position uh, in the software or in the web industry, okay? Uh, it was not the case 20 years later. If you think about the video game industry, for instance, 20 years later, you ha we have many cities in the world starting to uh, develop uh, video game 
And now this is, I don't know, Toronto or Vancouver, uh, who have a more or less monopolistic position uh, in, this, uh, in this industry. So <coughs> along the life cycle of an industry, there is a kind of process of ossification of the cluster uh, that, go, that can go with uh, formation of a very assortative network in which highly connected nodes uh, are tied predominantly with other highly connected nodes in the core. Okay? Uh, if you want to go further, I invite you to read papers of Burt or Coleman but, uh, on the concept of closure and bridging, which, which, which can be interesting to, uh, to, to better understand the, this idea. And then the ability of clusters to deal with a positive technological locking, meaning to reach the morph market, can go against their ability to produce the condition for technology for regional lockout. Not there is a mistake, not technological, but regional lockout. Okay, and then uh, resilience. Mm, Twenty minutes, or so I have to go just to show in terms of uh, graph uh, th this idea. Um, in this graph, on the left, you have a kind of random networks, a network. Uh, in the middle and on the right, you have two very hierarchical networks. You can see on these two uh, last uh, networks uh, that there are nodes that are highly connected and others that are poorly connected. Uh, in the middle, you have the degree distribution. So the two last networks have a very slope degree distribution. And in general, w in particular, when I start to do this kind of research, in my idea, uh, in my idea, when networks are very hierarchical, the more they are hierarchical, the more they are sortative. And no, we can find a kind of window of parameter uh, in which we can have a strong hierarchy and a very low, very weak assortativity. And this is the case for the last networks, where you can see a strong hierarchy and a negative degree correlation, which means that poorly connected people are mainly connected with highly connected people. Okay? Uh, but this is not natural in clusters. This is not natural in clusters. So th the in the paper, you can find many policy implications about this intuition. Uh, if I try to tell you a few words, uh, I don't know if you are familiar with the call for tenders uh, for uh, collaborative projects for scholars like ANR or for uh, FUE for um, clusters in France. But many times, people providing these grants to collaborate, tend to give money to people that have previously succeeded to collabor in collaborating together. And then sometimes policymakers tend to favor assortativity. And then they, they, when they favor assortativity, they participate to a kind of ossification process around a couple of scholars or a couple of companies, and then I don't know if the, this verb exists, they sclerose the innovative capabilities of the system. Okay? And many of us uh, think that when we offer us collaborative incentives, sometimes it's better to provide some random collaborative incentives for people that have never worked together, for instance. I, I, I will come back on this, uh, this idea. So um, a resilient cluster are the ones that display hierarchy, because hierarchy matters to com for clusters to compete on market exploitation in the world. And disassortativity, it, mean, it means a better overlapping between exploitation of mature market and exploration of new related ones. If I come back to the Silicon Valley, uh, and we, we make a newspaper uh, uh, synthesis, and we find that many people uh, of the new green tech company, like Tesla, SolarTech, come from Hewlett Packard and come from IBM. And it, it means that n networks evolve around the transversal technology, and this technology is reoriented towards new market. Because in a Tesla, you know the Tesla, of course, it's like a Renault Zoe, but it, it works better. Okay? It, uh, why? Because there are 
very efficient semiconductors inside. Uh, and, and the knowledge about semiconductors in the Silicon Valley is better than the knowledge on semiconductors in France. That's why this, te this transversal technology uh, uh, is reoriented to new markets. It's the same for solar panel. The US solar panels works better than French ones, but less than Chinese one. That's a, that's a particularity. So the consequences, uh, excessive firm size or oligopoly oligopolization are not necessarily the main reasons of the lack of resilience of cluster. What it matters is the structural and topological properties. Instead of unconditionally increasing network density, policymakers should surgically repair uh, the, the, the lack of openness of clusters. Uh, uh, subsidies for less conformist structures uh, is probably better than subsidies to uh, uh, confirm the, the previous relationships uh, and to refund uh, previous relationships. In 20 minutes, it's uh, very hard for me. So it was the, the it was a summary of the first uh, first paper. It's an old paper now. It's a five years uh, paper, but uh, this is my kind of theoretical background I try to uh, uh, use now in many uh, empirical papers. So, uh, I switch to the empirical paper. The visible hand of cluster policy makers, analysis of aerospace valley using a place-based network methodology. So I'll speak about empirics, but also methodology. The what? In France, like in other uh, European countries, Cluster policies are nowadays into debates because there are very contradictory assessments. Some scholars say, uh, yes, it's efficient. Yes, the economic return is good. And some other papers say, no, the economic return is not good. In France, we have scholars that show that the French uh, cluster policy has a very low uh, economic return. So we spend money for nothing. Okay? Uh, in Germany, it works more or less. In Japan, it works very well. So there are very contradictory assessments. Uh, and the idea, always the same, uh, is that this is the structure of networks as a key critical factor of cluster policy uh, returns. So what are the rationales of cluster policy? I speak about that in the introduction. Uh, cluster policy consists in repairing network failure in innovation process. And it's, this notion of network failure is really important because I think that if cluster policy works uh, work uh, in Japan or in Germany, but not in France, but not in Spain or elsewhere. Uh, this is not because of the existence of not or not of the cluster policy, but maybe uh, because of the networks this kind of cluster policy produce that can, be, that can explain the difference between each country or even in each, between each cluster. Um, the cluster policy generally consists in providing public collaborative incentives in France, in Spain, uh, in, 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 in UK, everywhere. The, the policy makers offer uh, financial incentives to people to collaborate together. Okay? Uh, they grant collaborative projects in a place. In a place and in a technological domain at the same time. Okay? I, I will go back on, on, on that point. Uh, and the idea of the paper is to see if the policymaker is a visible end uh, of the network structuring uh, of, of, uh, of uh, regional clusters. So how the selection process of collaborative incentives influences the structural property properties of knowledge network and who actually are the agent of the structural change uh, in cluster. And then we, we're going to study a 10 years uh, cluster policy in a particular place. The how. So a cluster policy, the French one. A case study, the aerospace valley, which received funds from the French cluster policy. A data set of 248 collaborative projects split into four periods. I will go back on that point. A very important piece of that, that paper is the place-based network methodology, which is the very original part of this paper. I don't know if, if I will have enough time to, to describe perfectly the this methodology. 
And we, uh, we're going to study the evolving structural properties of networks into the cluster and try to have a micro funded analysis of the structural change over the time uh, in, in this uh, cluster regarding the policy intervention. So four types of network fairer are generally in that identified uh, in uh, regional innovation systems. The first failure is about uh, the lack of collaboration between universities and firms, in particular in France, because the cultural history uh, of the French university and um, the kind of split between the, the, the elite of big company uh, and the university is very strong uh, in France, uh, but also elsewhere. That's the first uh, network failure because firms have to absorb knowledge produced by universities and also scholars have to absorb problems uh, that arise uh, in markets or uh, in, in the industry. The second network failure is about uh, the idea that a cluster has to renew itself through the entry of new firms. Okay? So there is sometimes a network failure uh, 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 related to the, the weakness of relationships be between new firms and incumbents or old firms. The third one is the necessity for cluster to combine local cohesiveness, so relationships inside the cluster, but also relationships uh, outside the cluster. Because the more a cluster is embedded in worldwide network, the, 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 the more the cluster perform. And finally, the, the last network failure is about technological relatedness, diversification, and new growth path. Uh, because Cluster dynamics are not never-ending stories of industrial specialization. Recall that Silicon Valley in the, uh, in the 50s uh, was specialized uh, in the military industry. Not today, I think. Uh, so this is not a never-ending story of about, about industrial specialization, nor a pure random process of jump between the shoes industry to the car industry. So this is not a, a, a never-ending story of specialization, but this is not also a random jump to one industry to another one. Uh, and then we can show that relatedness matters because in a new market, you can find the, the, um, the prints of the previous markets uh, on which the cluster is uh, specialized. Um, The idea for the policymakers is to is not to monitor, but uh, collaborative incentives provided by cluster policy can help cluster better structure themselves, and they can better structure themselves uh, about, of course, these two properties I just speak about uh, in, in the first uh, in the first paper. Uh, so the idea. Uh, uh, is that cluster have to combine these two properties of hierarchy and assortativity because hierarchy uh, is a good indicator of its growing maturity. So in terms of industrial organization, it means that the cluster exhibits growing capabilities uh, of central organization to manage the systemic process of innovation and also assortativity because this is an indicator of the knowledge path pathway between big or organization and less central ones, uh, such as spin-off or, or SMEs. And this is also a good indicator of the overlap between uh, mature and emergent uh, markets. So the case study, the cluster, the Aerospace Valley cluster has been uh, granted, selected and granted by the French government as one of the seven worldwide cluster. Uh, in Paris, you have, I think it's right. In Paris, you have two cl uh, worldwide cluster, I think. Optic Valley and another one, I don't remember. In Paris, we have one. Uh, in Toulouse, we have one. In Grenoble, we have another one. Uh, so the French cluster policy consists in a kind of two vectors selection process. The French government have selected uh, a couple of coordinates, a region and a technological domain. And my case here is Midi-Pyrénées, Toulouse, greater Toulouse region and aeronautic and, and space industry, okay? And this is the cluster. Uh, for the telecommunication, the French government has chosen Brittany and telecommunication around the Rennes and Brest, 
Okay. Um, two stages to reach grants for collaborative projects. First stage is certification of R&D research consortia by the governance structure of the cluster. It means that the cluster association in Toulouse uh, certified the best uh, collaborative project proposed by the university and the firms. And at the national level, second stage, national call from ANR and FUE that grant or not the certified project, uh, the, the regionally certified project. Okay? So that's why we have, uh, no, um, during these 10 years, the, the guidelines has changed. Uh, I summarize because I have only 10 minutes, maybe 12, I don't know. <coughs> the constraints of being located in the geographical perimeter uh, has been early relaxed. So in order to receive money to collaborate, it's, it, uh, at the beginning, you have to be located in the region, but now these cons constraints have been, uh, has been relaxed. Uh, strong incentive to include SMEs in R&D consortia and strong incentive towards the granting of inter-cluster collaborative projects. So now we, uh, we, we uh, reach now the, the database. We have 248 projects. We split this project in four periods from 2006-2015. And then we obtain uh, uh, four cohorts, more or less uh, balanced together. Uh, you can see here some demographic data with uh, big firms, SMEs, public research organization, and a few parts of others, like institution, knowledge platform, and so on and so forth. The location of organization that received the funds, uh, the grade is the external organization, extern uh, outside Toulouse, okay? And the black is uh, are located uh, in, in Toulouse. We spend a long time to disambiguate the data because Airbus is a big company and we go into the project to see which part of Airbus uh, is really involved in the project. For instance, the CEA is the, uh, is the biggest uh, research unit in France. So we have to, to find the team and the location of the team that, uh, that, was really in, that were really involved uh, in the project. So it's a very long job, but uh, we succeed in doing that. Just some point of the methodology. Uh, we do that uh, visually, I think it's better. Look on the, on the left uh, part. You can see C1, C2, C3, C4, okay? This is collaborative project that has been granted by the, uh, the, the French government, the French Ministry of Industry, <coughs> to go fast, okay? Each click, C1, C2, C3, C4, is a project. And this project include, include organization interacting together, okay? Um, it's a big problem for us to work with this kind of data. Because just to explain in one minute, I am involved in a very big project of 100 organization. My degree centrality is 100 because I have 100 relationships with the 100 companies in this consortia, consortium. So my degree centrality is very high. Now Tristan is involved in 10 projects uh, with admin, only three organizations in each project. Okay? So its degree centrality, centrality is 30, less than mine. But I think its role in the knowledge dynamics is stronger because it connects together, I don't remember the, na the number, 10 projects together. It connects 10 projects together. I connect only one, okay? So this is the big bias, bias, bias of network theory working with uh, aggregates like club, like association, like uh, every kind of click you can find uh, in network theory. Okay, so this is not very interesting for you, but for me it's really important, like Franz Gall said, uh, <laughs> it's a joke. Um, uh, it's really important, and the main contribution of the paper is about the methodology. So look, on the right, we put all the organizations that have the same relational behavior. Look, you can, you can see three organizations on the top, on the right and on the top, that have the same relational behavior. 
it means that they are connected in the same way to, to this network. You forgot to zero, just um, <laughs> uh, I try every, every, everything that I can try, I try. Uh, and then I group, I group this organization having the same behavior and I obtain a new network, which is not a network of organization, but a network of s the so-called places. Each, places, each place um, uh, being composed by organization having the same behavior. Okay? Uh, I will be in the same place than Tristan because uh, we, we go uh, every Saturday night with the same girl's friends outside. And I am not in the same place than you because uh, you go outside with over your friends, not the same than me, okay? So it's a kind of group behaviors. We, we, we regroup people having the same relational behaviors and we obtain the same natural. So if you want the slide, and I send you the slide, all is explained uh, in this slide, but I know it's too complicated in five minutes to explain that. Uh, look, a real example. This is the network of collaborative projects of the first cohort, and this is the network of places. And trust me, it's changed the result. And this is really more efficient to work with this kind of methodology than with this kind of methodology. Uh, the result. The results are presented here. What we can see is that uh, the degree distribution has declined over the four periods. And the assortativity is like a bell uh, curve, has increased and then decreased uh, the, the, the last period. So we have a decreasing hierarchy over the period. The influence and coordination capabilities of groups have been more distributed between a large number of less central places in the region. And we have a bell curve of degree correlation and a changing balance in the path between highly and poorly connected places. This is the, the aggregate result, but this is not sufficient to understand the dynamics of this region. So that's why we propose another methodology, an additional methodology, trying to look inside the network of place, uh, what is the structure inside this network of, of place for each course. And we use for that uh, the methodology developed by Moody and White 2003 about the nested system of P cohesive blocks. Each P cohesive blocks is a block including P, a number P of organizations that are connected together. You can see on the graph, the block B7 you have here uh, is um, a block of 85 organizations and we have to remove three links to disconnect this network. But the block B21 uh, includes 14 organizations but we have to remove 13 links to disconnect this part of the network. So this part of the network is really more cohesive. Okay? And we use uh, the algorithm, my PhD student have published the algorithm on the, the AIR package uh, recently, if you want to use this uh, kind of uh, methodology. Uh, we use this methodology to, s to, to, uh, to, um, uh, to show here the distribution of the, nest of the P cohesive blocks. The idea is the, folly, the folly following one. The more the highly cohesive blocks are closed in the distribution, the more they are connected together. The blocks, not the places, the block of places. For instance, B20 and B21 <coughs> are very close to each other. They are really connected. So very central places are connected together. Okay? And we do that for the four periods, and we obtain this uh, comparing distribution. You can see that at the cohort 2, 3, and 4, the peaks of the distribution are more and more separated in the distribution, meaning that highly cohesive places and blocks are less and less to connected together. It means that the assortativity of the network decreases because few connected places connect highly connected places, and at the beginning of the period, highly connected places are linked, were linked together. Just to give you an example, Airbus and Thales. In 2005, Airbus and Thales were very close in the networks. And now, in 2015, we have central places leaning by over small and medium companies. And uh, with 
not inverse, uh, with not airburst or Thales inside. And we can explain, it is, this is explained in the paper, that it corresponds to a diversification process with drones, agricultural uh, uh, system uh, drive by satellites, uh, many other markets that emerge uh, over, over the period. As I have only two minutes, I'm going to discuss these findings. And what we can show, uh, maybe this one is important. When we look at what we call the elite networks, the elite network, if I take this network, the elite network is the two, um, the places involved in the two uh, level of P cohesive block with a higher value of P. Okay, so in this case, it's B20 and B21. And I do that for all the four periods. And I, I, look, I look inside the composition of place of this elite network. And what we can see is that SMEs has, have succeeded in entering the elite networks of the, uh, of the cluster. It's really surprising because in the networks, we have 20% uh, of SMEs in the networks and 23 in the elite networks. So a little bit more than proportionally that, than in a network as a whole. Okay? It was not in the idea of the policymakers. The, the idea of the policymakers, it, it was just to increase the share of SMEs, but without any ideas of their ability to enter, after four periods, uh, the elite networks. And then, uh, what we can see also in one minute, it's, it's that, it's, that it is also SMEs that have increased the inter-clustering, the collaboration between clusters. And the idea is the same. The decreasing assertivity of the network is then supported by technological bridging and relatedness and by the SMEs, mainly by the SMEs. So the cluster, uh, the structural properties of the cluster has changed over the period with the help of SMEs that have contributed to diversification, and regional uh, openness. And I think this is the last side, slide. If I want to respect the time, I'm going to stop here. Thank you very much. Um, we're going to now try to comment a bit on, the, on what uh, Monsal said. He covered a lot, so maybe we cannot um, bring so much new to the discussion, but at least we try to um, Presented a bit out of our view and tried to raise um, some uh, some issues that we uh, that we discovered during the during the lecture. So good afternoon. Um, so the name of the, our presentation is the economics of clusters, a policy oriented approach. So we try to review uh, uh, his work, uh, the professor's work, and we try to focus on uh, policy oriented ideas because of our masters. Uh, and uh, to try to bring something new to, the, to our discussion. So this is the structure of our presentation. We start with the basic definition of clusters to get introducing uh, to people because we, uh, we are a very heterogeneous group. So peop some people from, uh, might not know, so we start from the basics. Then we have a, a traditional view of clusters and then clusters uh, as dynamic, uh, dynamic clusters and policy tools, then cluster as knowledge networks, network failures, and then we uh, use the Toulouse Air Space, just the conclusion uh, to not uh, repeat again the professor, and then we try to bring something new, and Luca will speak a bit about the San Diego Biotech cluster, and then we have some questions to the presenter. So definitions of clusters. Uh, here we try to get uh, three definitions of clusters to get us introduced to, uh, to the team. Uh, so Porter 2000 uh, talks of, uh, about clusters as a geographically proximate group of inter interconnected companies and associated institutions in a particular field linked by commonalities and complementarities. Uh, Bellflame, uh, it goes in a similar direction talking uh, about a full or partial agglomeration in one region of firms that benefit from each other's presence. And then we have Crespo and uh, the professor's work talking um, 
mainly focusing on cluster as network, uh, especially knowledge network, clusters as uh, localized knowledge networks in technological and market domains. So we see that the first two are more geographical and just talking about agglomeration and the and the third uh, definition is talk, talking about cluster as uh, knowledge networks uh, trying to differentiate between the first two and uh, but clusters uh, <coughs> there is a specific a specific uh, characteristic characteristic for each cluster so the structure in, uh, matters so structural pro properties have a high degree of variability from one cluster to another so when we are talking about clusters, we cannot assume that one cluster is the same uh, of the other. So each cluster has its own um, uh, specificities, but they also have some commonalities. Um, behind the background of those um, definitions we just saw, um, we can actually see that the uh, viewpoint that we be saw before in the presentation is not at all straightforward, at least for us when we were like, diving a bit into what clusters are and what uh, the literature, how the literature defines clusters. Because actually the most famous representation of clusters and the basic for um, cluster policy is the one by Porter, Porter's Diamond of competi Competitiveness. And um, what Porter is actually doing, he gave it, he's giving like four um, cornerstones of the diamond um, with the demand condition, local demand condition, the related supporting industries, the factor conditions in a local space, um, and the context for firm strategy and rivalry. So that you have like a vigorous, vi vi um, vigorous competition, you have um, coordination, trust to fo former information flows, um, you have lower transaction costs, um, um, sophisticated buyers in the area, um, evolving, uh, within the cluster. So actually the view of part is more a static view that policies have to reinforce those pillars at the same time and so they can reinforce the cluster and so they uh, will have like higher, higher productivity outcome, um, higher, um, uh, um, higher focus of uh, industrial focus and so we have higher outcomes. However, if you look at empirics as already mentioned, if we look at productivity and uh, cluster policies, um, there's either low or negative influence actually of cluster policies on productivity when we look at specialification. Uh, speci um, uh, and in innovations even, even more that we have, um, as already mentioned by Vincent, in, in France uh, there was found a negative influence on clustering on innovation. And um, the question is like, why is it so? And we saw, as um, Vincent already mentioned, is that actually we have different types of cluster and also involvement of cluster. And uh, the literature is actually um, uh, um, to react on this failure of clustering. Liter the literature is uh, reacting to that by looking at the different phases of a cluster, um, which are the following. So here uh, we are trying to differentiate from the diamond uh, presented. So cl we s here we see cluster as, d as a dynamic uh, character, uh, having an early phase, expansion, initial maturi ma mature phase and maturity. And uh, it's important to understand uh, and differentiating from the diamond that uh, policies should, should tackle uh, each phase uh, in a different way. So in, in the diamond we have policies uh, tackling the structure of the cluster as a whole, but we need to understand that each cluster ha it's, uh, has its phase and each phase has its a specific policy. For example, in the early phase, startup funding is essential for uh, giving credit for um, s uh, small and medium companies to sustain themselves and be capable of uh, innovating and connecting. In, uh, However, in the expansion phase, we need education, promotion of spin-offs, improving local conditions. I, and it's different from the initial mature phase, which uh, support of uh, private uh, research and development is important, as well as support of collaboration. And then in, mature, in the maturity phase, uh, it's a whole new uh, set of policies and in which we need uh, the renewal of the network. So 
uh, the cluster is to be there resilient and uh, ef uh, efficient. So here I will not spend so much time because uh, it was already, uh, uh, um, the professor already talked about it. The cluster has a no knowledge network and the importance of the degree of distribution and the de degree of correlation. Uh, for me, it's interesting the three uh, first uh, figures, the, uh, the networks in the top, because it gives a, a very uh, figures and a very illustrative uh, view of uh, networks and clusters. So in the first, we have the random network, which is the random attachment. It will be, um, it would be a, a, a low level, a degree of distribution in which we don't have a core. We don't have a big firm setting the standard. And then in the, in the middle, we have a, a assortative, a, um, assortative cluster where core connects with the core and periphery connects with the periphery. So high connected connects with other high connected institutions and uh, low uh, or weak uh, nodes connects with uh, weak nodes. And then in the third, we have the resilient network, uh, which has a good degree uh, of distribution. So we have big firms setting the standards. We have a hierarchy, posi a hierarchy and, but we have a, a disassortative networks in which there is the interaction between the core and the periphery. Uh, so here it's, uh, we took from the professor's uh, work. So here we have the degree of correlation in the bottom and the degree of distribution. So the degree of distribution increases, uh, the hierarchy will increase. And then if we move to B plus, uh, we have a more assertive networks. If we move to B minus, we have a disassertive. So here if we have a high degree of distribution and a low degree of correlation, we reach the resilient disassortative core periphery network. However, uh, networks uh, and clusters, they can fail. And he, it was uh, identified the two groups of network fa failures that should policies should tackle um, to have a resilient and efficient cluster. Uh, so first we have the group of filtering. Uh, where we have public knowledge dissemination absorption relates with the connection between universities and companies. Then we have the role of SMEs and uh, how they, uh, uh, they are born and if they are resilient and they can survive and then can build connections. We have global accessibility is how the local network is connected with a, no a global network. So it's not just national, but it's also, uh, it's uh, it's a global uh, network and knowledge flow. And uh, new growth paths and technological relatedness is the ability of the cluster renew itself and not be uh, locked in. And then we have the monitor, uh, monitoring and the structural properties that was already mentioned, the connectivity and density, hierarchy and assertivity. Um, so what is interesting for us now, what we can actually, what is the um, perspective of uh, um, knowledge network actually um, bringing us a new perspective for policy making for clusters um, over the life cycle that we saw that it's not, it's not a static thing networks, but it's like actually a dynamic, dynamic thing that we, at every point of time, um, we have to look actually at the network structure to have the, um, to have the right um, policy. And as we already saw in the, in the example, in the Aerospace example, we had a network that was in a mature phase. We had really specific problems of, um, uh, of an oligopolistic structure. So um, there was the danger that if there would be a shock, uh, economic shock, that the cluster could actually decline because they wouldn't be able to um, lock in new knowledge from outside. So you had actually the um, the um, danger of a, of a lock-in and therefore of um, a low uh, sustainability. And also, as we saw, the policy me measures that were taken in that time, they actually were able to, um, to lower assortativity as um, to uh, make the cluster more sustainable. However, we also saw that um, uh, um, sen um, that um, this uh, degree distribution actually also fell. So actually the 
there might be uh, also um, a loss in, uh, um, in efficiency of, of the network. And um, that leads all to the point that it's really hard to design a policy tool that actually um, tackles the cluster in a way that it makes it at the same time uh, more efficient and more resilient. And um, to make a bit clearer how different networks actually have different properties and different ways of uh, um, knowledge flows, we want to have a short look at the San Diego Biotech cluster and of its evolution during time. And for a bit of a background, actually the whole um, biotech uh, industry in San Diego started with the foundation of um, hybrid tech which was a um, biotech, biotech firm. And after the takeover by Ali Lilly, um, some years later, actually the um, researchers with a lot of um, tacit knowledge, actually they decided that they, that they don't want to be dictated by a big firm. So actually they decided to create their own spin-offs and um, they actually created almost 50 industrial sp spin-offs and creating actually a core network of highly um, uh, um, highly connected um, biotech firms. And um, that emerges together actually with the decline of the military cluster in the same area with a lot of um, um, worker distribution and the need for policies for worker distribution. So in that time actually policy was um, supporting the creation of um, biotech firms um, to create new chances of uh, um, of work and uh, um, and if we see actually the um, expansion phase we see a phase where the knowledge all the black uh, black points are actually the um, um, affiliates who former war worked for um, hybrid tech and the connections are other firms they also worked for um, or the other way around like outside uh, nodes who also worked for mm. the biotech firms who emerged from the uh, from hy hybrid tech. And what we can see that actually um, over the time and over the creation of new biotech firms there was uh, a clustering arising around the core of the former hybrid tech um, um, uh, scientists. And until the mature phase, actually, there was this high concentration of knowledge of uh, the former hybrid tech um, uh, scientists with a, um, um, with a high associativity. So they were really closely connected to each other mm -hmm. um, with the main knowledge flow going around uh, um, the core. And now the question is actually how could from this initial mature phase <coughs> arrive actually the case of now where we have uh, several hundred firms of uh, highly connected but also of low associative associativity and actually as we see a uh, um, rather um, sustainable network and in that case it was mainly due to worker um, mobility and but also that case shows again like worker mobility it also a hard thing to tackle by policies so that actually shows that we have like a lot of different um, mechanisms with it within the um, uh, creation of networks, within the life cycle of networks that might not be direct, directly um, tackled by policies, but are like the outcome of a lot of um, different mechanisms. Like in that case, it was also a lot the entrepreneurial spirit of the scientists. It was also the chance of creating uh, biotechnology dedicated firms that was given through um, financial institutions and to the law of um, property rights. So that leads us to um, some basic questions that all kind of surround around the question of uh, specific policy making of clusters. And the first question arises around the analysis of the Toulouse cluster. And it's the question about trade-off between efficiency and resilience. Um, as um, the policy they were doing kind of uh, aroused, they aroused a trade-off between efficiency and resilience, uh, possi possible. And what are actually the practical actions and policies to balance those, um, uh, this trade-off? Because in the, in the case of Toulouse, it maybe didn't didn't work in the way it was uh, it was wanted. The second question is about um, uh, maybe 
focus also on the biotech industry where also, as I said, pr um, proprietary and financial institutions played a huge role. And the question would be what role can those play um, as policy pool tools also to enforce other clusters, um, not only in biotech, but especially in biotech. And the third question um, is uh, around, um, it's about the opposite of rel relatively open um, knowledge networks um, as the high integration of capabilities in big firms. So is there actually a crowding out by uh, um, cluster policies where we have like more open regimes of knowledge to actually investments by big firms into their uh, innovation capabilities? Um, and the third question, which is kind of the basic questions around this, is the, uh, tackling the cri critic by Duranson, who actually criticizes the over-complex approach of reinforcing clusters and having cluster policies, and actually the uncertain outcomes on the other side, as we saw uh, also what the other questions are tackling. And the question would be, how can this perspective you showed in your presentation of um, uh, network dynamics and knowledge networks kind of inform and simplify policy making. Um, thank you very much for your attention and uh, we would like to give the chair back to you. Wow, congratulations. I think I, I will invite you to, to make my presentation in the next conference. <laughs> No, I'm really uh, imp impress impressed by. Yeah, well. Maybe I will make some comments on your presentation, very short comments, and 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 try to reply. And and the, the more I will make comments, your presentation, the less I will have time to reply for the questions. So it's it's better for me. Uh, no, really congratulations because you uh, you you went to you you went to find to search from over papers that really complement uh, my presentation. Uh, of course, I think it's that's paper I, I quote myself, I use also myself. Uh, for instance, the paper of, of Casper is really interesting. And uh, there is also another one, the, the one of Owen Smith and Powell on biotech in, I think, I'm sure you, you have seen this paper also on the, in, in particular uh, uh, about the phases. He showed that uh, in the early phases, this is the universities that connect firms and when we reach the maturity phase, uh, the, the university go out the network and the venture capitalists uh, try to, uh, to start to connect all over the companies and so on and so forth. It's really interesting. Um, and uh, uh, I, I don't speak about one thing you, you, you speak here and, and it's very important, is that network evolve and structure themselves by worker mobility. Uh, of course, we. I, I saw, I see that when I, when I am involved in my case studies uh, and discuss with people. But it's difficult for me to to use that in empirical, uh, in an, emp an empirical design. But it's really important, the mobility of workers and also the, the entrepreneurship by scientists is also really important. And I think it can help me to uh, reply to the first question. Uh, one week ago, I write in the. Echo, the, the, the economic newspaper uh, in France, uh, I write the answer to, to this question. Uh, so the question, what are the practical action and policies to balance between the two, between e efficiency and resilience? Uh, my answer will be very pro provocative, but I think we have to forget the cluster policy in France. We have to change radically the, the the way to incentivize collaboration between universities and firms, uh, because what we need more than everything else is to change the culture of scholars and the cultures <laughs> of uh, entrepreneurs. Because we have at least three network failures uh, in France, uh, uh, and we have not this one in other countries. Uh, the, the management of big companies in France uh, is the, the monopoly of the highest uh, high school in France. And these people are really far from the academic sphere. Okay? So it's very difficult to interact with people who you never met. We never, we never interact together because we never met together. 
maybe now we met together, so maybe we will interact uh, in the future. Okay? So as the specialty of France, the productive system of France of big company uh, is typified by the fact that managers come from high school completely <coughs> 20 years ago, the high school were disconnected from the academics. Now, no, the things are changing in France. Uh, and I think the, 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 the propensity of uh, companies and universities to interact will change in the future because high schools has changed also. Okay? Uh, you are not French, but you, you have to know that uh, all the highest school in engineering school or business schools in France today uh, collaborate with our PhD school uh, in the university and and the high school wants that the student uh, reach the PhD okay but it's since 10 years no more okay and that's the, the network failure come from that so if I have to uh, <coughs> to uh, to answer this this is not really the question but if I have to to uh, give advice to policymakers is don't forget the cluster policy and focus on the on the, our higher uh, education system. Okay. Um, uh, in the case of Toulouse, uh, if you have and you have, you have, you have do it, uh, you have did it. Uh, if you read carefully the paper. I have no criticisms to make because I was surprised myself that this cluster succeed in uh, di diversify the, 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 the domain in which the, the transversal technology of space and aeronautics uh, diffuse uh, all, all, all in many markets like uh, your GPS, your drones, uh, agriculture, uh, health also. Many, 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 for instance, Renault, the car industry, uh, uh, is, uh, is going to locate a plant in Toulouse in order to uh, improve, uh, uh, to, to, uh, to, to be more competitive uh, facing Germany, maybe, uh, the, the uh, s navigation systems of car and autonom autonomous vehicle, vehicles and so on and so forth. So many, change, many things are, are changing. Uh, but what I show in the paper, and I was surprised myself, is that the, 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 the people that drive this change are not big companies. This is small <coughs> companies. Of course, when I present this paper in conference, but people say, but this is really small, small company? No, of course, this, the company are increasing and increasing. Now there are medium companies, of course. Um, the second question, wow. Mm. I'm not a specialist of property rights regimes, so uh, of course there are many differences in between the US and Europe in, in terms of that, and I think it probably probably change many things in the network structuring. Uh, but uh, I'm, I'm not sure to give you very relevant answers. Maybe you can just. <laughs> um, the, the, pro the, the third question, the crowding out effect. And it's related to the question, of, to the fourth question of Duranton, because Duranton speaks a lot about the crowding out effect. Do the f do the big firms that receive funds will uh, engage these funds without the policy? That's the question, more, more or less, I think. Uh, there are many crowding out effects, and the more the policymaker provides incentives to collaborate, the more you will have crowding out effect, because of course. Uh, when you uh, meet Airbus or when you meet Thales, there is one guy that is responsible of uh, the, the public funds. His job is to, uh, to enter public funds uh, from uh, FUE, ANR, and over B BPI, the public uh, investment bank in France, and so on and so forth. So uh, there is a strong crowding out uh, effect uh, in, in this policy, but in all policy, in all innovation policy, there are, there are crowding out effects. Uh, the, I invite all of you to read the paper of Duranto, which is a very provocative paper for the question four. The paper is entitled The Californian Dreaming, uh, The Californian Dreams, or something, something like that. And he uh, demolir, demoli, uh, it's, it's a kind of uh, demolition enterprise of all the cluster policy in the world. Of course, Duranto is a liberal uh, thinker, uh, uh, but a very interesting one. Uh, and the, but he make big, a very, very big mistake in this paper. 
because he only rest his analysis on the paper of Duranton Martin on the very old policy in France, which was not a cluster policy, which was the, the policy of system productif loco. Uh, it was a policy for old and declining industry. And then they try to see if this policy for old declining industry in peripheral regions succeed or not to uh, improve, update the innovation output, uh, output of this region. And of course, no, not at all. Okay, uh, and their mistake uh, for Duran Tong and and, uh, and and his colleagues uh, is to uh, generalize that at all the clusters policy, even if the French cluster policy we have now is completely the reverse, because now the French cluster policy consists in selecting the best region in the most profitable knowledge domain, so it's completely the reverse, and. Uh, today, there are only one uh, assessment exists uh, in France of this policy, uh, which has been produced by uh, France Strategy, uh, and according to me, not relevant at all, because there are many bias in the, the, the analysis. Uh, then I think, uh, to, um, to, to, to reply to the question, the idea is not to implement cluster policy. The idea is to make good and relevant um, uh, diagnostic of the structure of the region related to the phase of the market. And you quote the paper of Brainer and Schlump, you make a mistake, this is Brainer and not Boehner, uh, Brainer and Schlump, uh, we, who said uh, if we are in the early phase we have to promote startup, if we are in the maturity phase we have to uh, change uh, network structuring. If we are uh, in the growing phase, we have to sustain private R&D. If we are in the early phase, we have to sustain uh, public R&D. So there is no um, um, one-size-fits-all cluster policy. We need experts, we need regional experts in each region to say, okay, the aircraft industry is really mature. Now we uh, produce um, aircraft in China, uh, so we have to uh, uh, recover new trajectory using our knowledge, we have to diversify markets. Uh, at the reverse, uh, in, in, a, in the drone industry, in Toulouse, same place, uh, we are in a growing market, so we have to find what kind of markets we can uh, focus with this technology. For instance, the, 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 the stronger fault France, French, France has made in the past, uh, we have the best um, Cartography, uh, uh, the best yeah. mapping industry in the world, Michelin and IGN. We have one of the best space industry in the world, in Toulouse. And we use Google Earth. Okay, and where Google Earth come from? Google and the NASA. We, 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 we will be able to be the first, I think. But we are completely uh, involved in the space industry on one side, in the mapping industry on the other side, without any interactions, because our high school are really specialized in space or in geography or in, okay? And if you go to Stanford, you enter in the university, you see anthropology on your left, physics on your right, front, front of you, uh, uh, biology and economics in the same uh, place, okay? That's the main idea, the best cluster policy we can implement is to change the, the higher education system, for me. For me. Uh, in order to avoid this kind of crowding out effect or over, over effect. I don't know if I have replied to the fourth question. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But we can, you can compliment if you want. Um, no, I think, um, thank you very much for your... Uh, Welcome. For your answers and maybe just to defend Durant in that way, he's at least mentioning the bias um, uh, within the research, within the assessment, that actually there might be a bias because the policy was um, focused on uh, declining uh, yeah. firms. Mm. So at least like they're making a mistake, but they at least recognizing this, mm. the mistake. Um, well, I, I would then like to give the, give the floor or give open the floor to the to students. So I think we can maybe collect three or four four questions maybe and then uh, we can give back to you to answer the questions from the floor. 
Um, are there any? Okay, you. My name is Victoria from Option A, and I would like to answer um, uh, to ask you uh, to answer some questions regarding the network building. First of all, you mentioned the collaboration of um, um, firms and involvement of um, R and D, public R and D um, of uh, institutions and public agents into these networks. My question is: what Either you um, represent in your network uh, these actors. I mean, our public R&D and uh, public agents, or it's uh, just pri uh, private enterprises. Or if you don't involve them, how would the shape of this network change? Um, also, another question is um, maybe you can give an advice of how to measure the density of collaborations between uh, agents. Um, maybe you can give us some specific methodology uh, because it's uh, quite hard to do and uh, maybe you know instruments for this. Um, also, what kind of methodology do you use for your research um, and what kind of programs do you use for building such beautiful networks? Uh, the Thank last you. question, please. What, qu what programs do you use for building such ah, networks? Okay, software. Okay. Uh, Thank so you. the third and the fourth question is more or less the, the same. Okay. Uh, Thank you for the presentation. My name is Eric from Option A, and I have several questions re relating to the uh, presentation we just had. I guess the first question I have is that um, when we consider SMEs and their participation in the agglomerate, in the clustering networks, um, are we underestimating the costs of having them connect into the network primarily because maybe of the absence of their capabilities to recombine the knowledge that may be had in the network and utilize that for productive means? The second question I have is related to frontier technologies uh, um, of, of the time. So maybe those relating to digitalization and then advanced robotics and in these um, technologies it seems like um, more dispersed and distributed networks don't seem to be the one all solution that is being promoted by um, different countries that intend to claim technological leadership so the, the question there is that um, maybe the the other hierarchical networks that we're seeing are are maybe discounting the capabilities of well-endowed um, institutions with resources in order to continue to push the technological frontier. What what what's your take on on that? That's it. Um, I know if you want maybe, uh, maybe to. Maybe I can start now because I'm sure yeah, 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 I yeah, forget yeah, yeah. the first question. Um, yeah, the f your, your f thank you for the, the, the questions. Yeah, yeah. Um, as, I, as I just told before, if we make dy dynamic analysis of networks uh, in the early phase of the, 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 the emerging technology, we find university at the core, at the core of the network. Okay, and uh, as far as the network grow in maturity, uh, we sh we uh, so we see uh, firms entering the core of the of the networks. So. What about the real networks? If I speak about my case studies in France, uh, if, I, if, if I analyze the network of uh, navigation satellite systems, I speak about one technological domain. And as this technological domain is emerging, I will find many universities in the core. But in reality, the network of Toulouse is not the network of the navigation satellite system, because the network of the aircraft industry is still working. Okay, uh, so it, it's really if you if you want to work on networks, you have to uh, make a great job to uh, decide what is your technology, what is your market, uh, because I see many papers uh, dealing with networks uh, without clarifying the frontiers, uh, not the geographical frontiers, but also the technological frontiers. So uh, in our uh, research is because I wrote many papers on, on many technological domains. Uh, we, there is a kind of power law that shows us that university enter in the emerging phase, connect 
unconnected people, and then move more or less outside the core of the network uh, when the technology reaches maturity. But it doesn't mean that universities disappear. It just means that universities uh, start to, to, to enter the core of another market, of another uh, next market. Okay. Uh, I say that because uh, I didn't have enough time, but in, in <coughs> the paper I present, uh, I, don't, I, I don't know if you have clearly seen the statistics, but the growing uh, entering of SMEs uh, was at the detriment of public research organization because public research organization in the elite networks goes from 25% to 10% at the end, I think, something like that, okay? So it's a little bit dangerous for the knowledge dynamics in the, in the city. But maybe universities are now involved in robotics, in, in uh, artificial intelligence or something else, but not in the, uh, in the aircraft and space industry. We can imagine that, okay? Um, what uh, we, uh, there are many softwares to, uh, to develop network analysis. My young colleagues use AIR uh, because you have many package in AIR uh, uh, which allow you are working uh, efficiently on, on networks and, and on networks dynamics also. Uh, I'm a old guy, so I use UCNet, one of the first software to, uh, to, uh, to design a network analysis or PAGEC. Uh, which are the, the two main uh, software for? They know how they, they know very error. Okay. Uh, I think I replied. The, the, uh yes, mm. we have a relation together. Is it a strong or weak relation? That's your question. I think yes. Yeah, so it's very it's very complicated uh, to do that. Uh, and in each conference, I have this question. <laughs> so. Um, there are many ways to deal with that. If you work on very small sample, so like a, a small cluster, you, uh, you make interviews and you can, you can uh, ponderate, the, 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 you can weight the, 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 the relationships. So it's only possible in very small sample. Uh, in big sample, for instance, I have worked on all the European mobile phone industry. W what we did is we consider that when one organization is involved e with another organization in a research consortia, uh, the weight is zero. But if these two same organizations are involved together in two projects, the weight is one. Okay, uh, remember the example I, I, I took uh, one hour before. Uh, I'm, I'm involved in the 100 uh, organization project. Do you really think I interact with the 100 uh, organization? No. But if among these 100 among these 100 organization, I'm involved with two of them in another project, we can imagine that the relation is. Uh, actual, it's, it's, an, it's an actual relation, so I can wait one. Uh, in order, to, in technical uh, aspect, I remove all the uh, all the closure in big networks because a closure uh, means that people are involved in the same click and only in one click. So I remove all this one dimension click, and I simplify it. I can show you on my laptop if you want. Uh, with a graph, but it's quite simple. But you're right, if you want to lead some analysis uh, using network theory, you have to clarify the, the, the quality of the links. And there are many te techniques to, uh, to ponder, to weight the, the, the relations. And I forget the two other questions of your neighbor, I'm sorry. Uh, First question was, are we overestimating the capability are we overestimating the capabilities of SMEs to connect and productively use the knowledge generated in those networks? Do I over, I over, you think I overestimate? No, I think the research as a whole, the, w would you think that there's an overestimation of SMEs' ability to recombine external knowledge with what they have and channel that into something that's productive? 
uh, if I if I have well understood, uh, the question is about the necessity for SMEs to connect to others in order to combine their own knowledge. I mean, their ability to use the outside knowledge. The um, we have to come back to the the notion of, of network. Uh, why organization, big or small, uh, build relationships? Uh, in general, they build relationships to access external knowledge. We are right with, with this uh, with this idea. But do you uh, do you think you and all, all the, the other students uh, do you think it's easy for an organization to open his knowledge base to a partner? No, because the main uh, purpose of a firm is to appropriate his own benefits of his, of his own knowledge production. So every organization, big or small, has to deal with this balance between ac knowledge accessibility, knowledge exter external knowledge accessibility, and internal knowledge appropriation. Okay? And the particularity of small firms is that in general they favor appropri um, accessibility over appropriability. Why? Because in general small firms d are not able to reach the mass market alone. Yeah. Of course there are some exceptions. Google is an exception. It was a small firm. It's now, uh, uh, it is now a big firm. But, but how many small firms die for one firm, Google, that uh, succeeded? Okay? So in general, uh, small firms uh, um, under, uh, overestimate ap um, accessibility over appropriability, okay? Because this is a condition for them to integrate their own knowledge in existing technological systems that are well, well installed uh, on markets. I, I don't know if I reply uh, uh, the question, but uh, what I observe since 15 years uh, is that small firms uh, successful small firms are the ones that are more open uh, than the yeah. others. Okay? Uh, I would like to add, add something. Yes, we, we have also to uh, think about uh, why small firms exist. Uh, in general, small firms are created by engineers uh, working on big firms and the R&D management of the big firms is not agree with the ideas of the engineer mm. but say to the engineers okay you can create your own company we will work together this is called a spin-off okay um, so spin-off are created uh, because uh, due to the more disruptive knowledge produced by this, the, the engineers belonging to the big firms. What I observe in this, the last paper I present today uh, is that uh, for, for spin-off, spin-off produce different knowledge of big companies, mm. but also spin-off have different relational st strategies of big companies. In general, big companies try to connect to other big companies in order to produce together te big technological standards mm. in an industry, in a very specialized <laughs> way. If you look at the relationship strategy of uh, spin-off of small companies, they are more uh, involved in, in uh, inter-industry relationships. We have the data and we, clear we clearly uh, observe on the data that, that spin-off uh, change their industry uh, with a relation and big companies do not change. Okay? So the, the, the rational behavior is completely different. Okay, um, any more questions at that point? Hello. Hello. Uh, I'm Leila from Argentina, from Option C Development. We can speak Spanish if you want, I prefer. Ah, perfect. <laughs> <laughs> um, so my question, I have two short questions. Oh, I don't know if the answers are short. <laughs> but the first one would be connected, you said, when you were talking at the end of the response to the guys uh, about um, policy recommendations, that it was important to do diagnosis of networks. Mm. 
but also maybe um, my question is about how in France they are deciding which sectors uh, should be the priorities for clusters now nowadays and if you think they are doing a right uh, foresight and diagnosis process or if that's where we can identify one of the failures. And the second one, it would be the same one, uh, but at the European Union level. And if you think that if the European Union has a good uh, clusters policy or not, because in Latin America, what we do a lot is we uh, copy or just try to imitate <laughs> the European Union uh, without looking at the success or not of the policy, sometimes just because of budget or just because there is this admiration towards Europe. Uh, so it's for me, it's interesting to see your take on that. Thank you. I'm, I'm going to reply now because I, I, I will forget the, the question. Uh, first, uh, for the second question, if you are interested ab about this topic on uh, Latin America, I can introduce you uh, Elisa Guiliani, who is a specialist of cluster in Latin America. Very, uh, very intelligent uh, scholars on, on that topic. The first question, um, very interesting and difficult question. Uh, I, I will reply the, like uh, our president Macron, yes, and at the same time, no. <laughs> um, um, for, for the French cluster policies, so the pole de compétitivité uh, policy, uh, it, it was a, a, a call for proposal. It was a French call for proposal uh, at destination of the French uh, administrative regions, and then French administrative regions have to reply to this call for proposal by proposing a technological domain and uh, 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 critical mass of organization working on this technological domain. So I cannot say that the technological domain has been, has been chosen by the, the, the government. Okay? Uh, but of course, uh, the Ministry of Industry uh, is, there is a kind of uh, top-down approach consisting in saying, yes, in France we have uh, now uh, we have to work on that topic, on that topic, or, or on that topic. So it's a mix between between both, because of course uh, uh, the, the 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 region of Brittany has uh, replied on telecommunication because we have uh, 50 years of tradition of telecommunication in Brittany since the Second War. Of course, Toulouse in aircraft, aircraft industry, uh, Grenoble in uh, nanotechnologies. So it's normal that it, it comes from the the, the regions. Uh, but of course, there are some national priorities. Uh, uh, for developing countries, um, uh, your question is about diagnosis and. Uh, the European yes, the European Union level. Uh, there, there, there is no uh, cluster policy at the European level. There are many things about cluster at the European level, but not directly a policy. First, there are network of clusters, uh, 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 an association managing a network of clusters. There are something very uh, funny that uh, uh, there is a European association that grants with medals some clusters. For instance, my cluster in Toulouse was a gold medal of cluster management. Blah, 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 blah. It's a kind of uh, uh, it's a kind of label. Um, and why there is no cluster policy at the European level? I think this is a good thing that there is no cluster policy at the European level. Uh, because, I, because we have another policy, which is the framework policy. Uh, and I think, at the, for me, geography matters. And I think for R&D, for very expo explorative knowledge domain, we need the regional dimension. And at the reverse, for the market domain, for the diffusion of knowledge, for the diffusion of technologies, uh, we need uh, the, the European scales. Okay? Uh, so we have a kind of cluster policy in Europe, but not based on the geographical dimension, not on the regional dimension. Uh, because if you look at each cluster in Europe, and I have the data for France, for instance, uh, the, the, the aerospace valley cluster is composed of uh, national projects, national consortia, and also uh, H2020 programs that are uh, certified by the, the cluster. So there is a kind of nested system of collaborative incentive at the regional level and the European level. And finally, at the national level, there is nothing in terms of collaboration. Just 
cluster policy is a French one, but uh, the, the consortia are decided at the regional uh, level. So there is a complementarity between the regional level, which is really dedicated to exploration, uh, uh, collaboration between universities and, 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 and industry at the regional level. And for the, ex the exploitation phase, for the market phase, we need big European uh, consortia. Okay? So it's really complementary. It's a kind of cluster policy, but without geography. Yes, uh, I would like to ask, um, I'm Brenda uh, from Option A. Uh, uh, please, uh, please speak. Uh, ah, sorry, yes. I'm old uh, guy now. <laughs> Uh, yes, I wanted to ask that well, Granovetter studied for Silicon Valley the importance of uh, networks with venture capital firms for the success of this cluster. Uh, so I would like to ask about uh, how these uh, networks with venture capital firms or with uh, um, financial firms works uh, in for the performance and resilience of clusters and particularly for the case of Toulouse. Uh, for the case of Toulouse, the, the venture capital, uh, uh, for the case, it, there is nothing. No. <laughs> and, and, and it's a huge problem. Um, when I look at empirical studies about knowledge networks in the US, of course, one of the main nodes are venture capitalists. Mm. Uh, and we d when we do that in France, uh, this kind of nodes uh, completely disappear. Uh, but where the venture capitalists of the Silicon Valley come from? They come from the industry. Mm. And the main problem in France is that uh, industry is not really involved in the risk management uh, of funding. Uh, uh, every startup in France waits from the state to be, to be funded. Mm. They don't wait from the big firms. Some firms start. Airbus has recently created a venture capitalist fund uh, to, to, to help new, uh, new, new companies. Uh, so the, 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 um, the type of fundings between the US and France is really different. And of course, it has strong consequences on the structuring of networks. Because in the US networks, you always find, find venture capitalists connecting unconnected organization. Uh, and you, can, you, can, you don't find that in France. Maybe one day we will find that, but not uh, not today. Hi, thanks for your presentation. I'm Brian from Option thanks B. To you. Um, so when you were answering some of the questions, a uh, question kind of sprung to my mind because I'm more of a macro guy. I'm kind of more interested in the macro I'm side of things. <laughs> so I, I just thought um, when you were talking about European Union. Is there any literature that you've done, uh, that you've seen, or work that you've you've created that looks at the impacts of like increasing openness on a local cluster? So increasing openness at the macro, at the national level, on a local cluster like Silicon Valley or any other cluster that may be around. Does, does it um, strengthen a cluster, or does it kind of tend to disperse it? Because um, I, I could see a case for both both effects. You could see clusters perhaps losing some of their resources, skill, talent, and so on. Or yeah. perhaps with greater flows, they're able to attract smarter people if there's fewer sort of um, barriers uh, between borders. It's very interesting. So I'm not a macroeconomist. Uh, I n uh, there are some papers, uh, of course, showing that uh, migration has a positive impact of cluster efficiency. Uh, migration and, uh, and corruption has a negative impact uh, on cluster efficiency. Uh, so there are many uh, research uh, that mix uh, micro and macro uh, uh, arguments to explain that the the, hop the, the openness of the region for, for migration is, is is good for 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 innovation and, and attractiveness and and, uh, and clearly innovation output because. Uh, in each paper, the, the, the on the left of the regulation is patents. So, uh, so th there are. If you if you want some references, I can try to to find that. Yeah. Thank you. Mm. And it's a good news. It's the result is a good news. <laughs>
All right, are there any other questions? Um, when you were saying that it, there is a crowding out effect uh, always when government uh, finance yeah. all these, and as you said, that companies have guys, uh, people dedicated just to get the funds, but then you said that in France there is no venture capital. So I guess that today there what's your thinking on this because maybe in can I am thinking of Argentina for example the level of private investment is very very low historically and mm. nowadays so maybe it's similar uh, in France in the way that you don't have a very active private sector so probably there is no crowding out and if the government was not investing on this there will be no innovative clusters uh, what do you think about that oh it's a really complicated question um no, I think w once again, it's a, mm, we d in France we don't have the culture of private funding because firm, firms, big firms are completely uh, are not completely aware about this idea. Uh, once I travel a lot in the Silicon Valley, of course, for, for my job, and when you, when you enter in the Google campus, one of the first uh, big building you have front of you is the uh, Google uh, the Google Venture building. So clearly, it's a very big building with more than 400 startups inside, funded, uh, funded in at least in terms of uh, real estate uh, by Google. Okay, uh, so this is not a uh, uh, this is a particular private funding. This is not a venture capital. This is just a, a hosting uh, hosting f to host uh, funds to host, uh, but this is not in the, in the French culture to do that. Because every startup uh, born is a potential competitor, I think, or something like that. I don't know. Uh, so. But I'm not a specialist about the uh, innovation funding. So, mm. Mm. but w w what I have looked in the literature is that private equi equity uh, venture capital uh, of the Silicon Valley are managed by people coming from the industry. So by people coming from Hewlett Packard, from IBM, for uh, so, so they know the sector and know, they know the challenge to found this firm or this. Um. All right. If there are any more questions, um, I would like to thank you very much for uh, for today's session. Thank you.